Welcome to One on One. I'm Greg Bass, your host from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper. It's a big day here at PAC 14. They're all big, and it's big because we are doing our election interviews, continuing with these. Today we have Alex Scott, who's running for Wacombe County Council, District 2, as a Democrat. Welcome, Alex. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. So how's it going out there? It's going well. It's going well. It's my first time uh, campaigning. I'm going for public office, so it's been interesting. It's a, it's a fun learning curve. So why would you do this? Why would you want to be on the county council? There's the million dollar question. Um, you know, I never thought that I would actually uh, run for office. Um, and uh, owning a business downtown, I started to really get involved. Uh, a lot of people would come into the bar, a lot of politicians. No, you have, you have the brick room downtown. I do. Yes. I do. It's not a plug for that. <laughs> no, yeah, but um, people should know because it's been an important contribution to the downtown change. I, I appreciate it. To, to White Comico as a whole, um, to, to growing a city center within White Comico, um, I think is important. Uh, I think it's important to the outlying communities as well. As we grow, uh, Hebron can grow, Mardella will grow. Um, I'd like to see uh, you know our smaller areas you know, grow as well. Um, so uh, if it's a small contribution I can make uh, to owning a business, to running a, a successful business, it's it's what I want to do for my hometown. What's your background? My background uh, is more sales driven. Uh, I was a history major in college. I, um, I thought I would want to go into law, but uh, I, I started to, to get away from that and, and wanted to, to be more involved with uh, businesses. Um, very people oriented. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I have a business that's service oriented and now I'm looking into public service. So I think it's an easy transition to make, um, especially when I'm constantly hearing the concerns of people that come in. I, a lot of uh, my uh, fellow candidates you know, do a lot of door knocking and I always joke with them, I don't have to do that as much because everyone comes and knocks on my door. So I'm right. constantly meeting people in the, uh, in the community um, and they, they love to voice their concerns to me and my door is always wide open for them to come in and do so. Do you have an issue so much with the incumbent, or you just want to serve? I, I actually like Mark. Um, you know, he, he's from I believe, Idaho. Yes, uh, Mark Kilmer, the incumbent. Yeah, who's Republican? Idaho, and um, he and I see eye to eye on, on a few issues. Uh, but I think my main issue with him is that he he votes no a lot, and uh, I think he's a business owner, um, and that's why I, I love to push that I'm a moderate because. I, I see value in you know investing, um, and, and that's what I want to do with Wicomico. I want to invest in Wicomico as a business. If I don't continue to grow my business, um, then it declines. And I think that a community is the same way. You know, you have to build value, uh, and that's that's my biggest concern uh, with him. But um, no, my decision to run wasn't particularly uh, with him, but that uh, I think that I can bring fresh ideas. Um, to, to the area. Give me an idea of what some of the fresh ideas are. Sure. Uh, Sorry, you walked into that one. <laughs> I did. You said no gotcha <laughs> questions. Uh, no, I, it, it, it's, it's been asked over and over again. Um, and my big ones are education, I, I think. Uh, and that's what everyone's been saying. And that's because, you know, if you want to invest in something that's going to change a, a multitude of, of concerns and issues for people from opioids to the economy, um, for me, if, if education grows, uh, so will the population. Um, I'll have better customers. I'll have better employees. Um, you know, and the opioid issue is a big one. And if we increase our education, we'll, that will decline as well. A lot of studies have shown um, with a better educated uh, population, your drug use goes down. Uh, and I'd love to see that. Um, my other ones, uh, a big one for me is business. You know. Wicomico has these big signs out saying that we're open for business. Um, 
But now that I have a business in Wicomico, I can tell you it's, it's not that easy. We don't make it that easy on Wicomico businesses, especially bars and restaurants. And um, a lot of the, uh, the bars and restaurant owners, we, we all talk and we have issues. And because of the state of things, um, we don't really have a voice. And a few of them are hoping that I can be that voice for, for all the, the businesses and, and restaurants uh, in Wicomico. That's a unique question. That's one I don't get to ask everyone, but you're the first bar restaurant owner I've had in for this. Um, the dispensary system, is that a problem for you guys in what you do with your business? Because I know there's been a lot of talk about getting rid of the dispensary system. I think the county executive, if he's reelected, might look at that. Um, where are you on that? Well, and Bob and I actually go back. Um, I've known him for years, and I know that was a concern of his when he had his bar, uh, the cellar door. Right. Um, and then when, at some point, that, you know, he, he kind of dropped that, and I was disappointed in that. Um, and, and I like to tread lightly because the dispensary is part of a Comica right now, and all of the bars and restaurants, we're relying on them. Um, Why Comico County controls... Um, my business, in a sense. You basically, I don't know if people even know this, you sure. have to buy all of your liquor products through them. I, I do. So, Wicomico County is in the liquor business. Right. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of nuances uh, uh, to that. And, uh, you know, Wicomico County is the last, or us in Montgomery, I think, are the last right. two. Now they're going to be uh, left with this system in place. Worcester got rid of it a couple of years ago. Right. And yeah. they've been flourishing since. Right. Um, you, you look at... You know, when you hear about a new restaurant or bar opening up, it's always in West Virgin City. And this is the kind of competition that we're up against. You know? Right. Uh, a lot of people say, oh, are you worried about the competition in the bars and restaurants downtown? And I'm always quick to say, no, well, I'd like more. I want Salisbury to have a thriving downtown so that the people of Wicomico can have a place to go. You know, we don't have to go to Ocean City or we don't have to go to Cambridge or, or Baltimore, Annapolis, D.C., um, you know, I want us to compete, um, and it, it makes it a bit more difficult for us. Uh, there's some good people that work for the dispensary. Uh, I, I genuinely appreciate them. Um, uh, it's just it's unfortunate for us because it, it costs us a good bit of money. I, I mean, if anyone uh, at home thinks about whatever business they're in, you imagine, um, you know, your your government gets involved and says, you know, hey, you want to sell clothing? Well, we're going to buy it first, and then we'll sell it back to you after we marked it up, you know, extra. And then we're going to tax on top of that. And, and we already know that liquor is taxed 9%, where, you know, everything else is taxed 6%. Right. Um, and I think that if we could adjust this a bit, we can still keep the dispensaries open. Um, but then we can also add so much potential. There's so much potential for, uh, you know, more liquor stores or, um, you know, grocery stores. Um, there's, there's competition and that's what America was you know, built on is competition. And, and right now we don't have that. And, and in talking to a lot of, uh, uh people in my comic they want their beer and alcohol. Um, they go to Delaware. Yeah. You hear that all the time. They, they all, and, and that's Delaware is not stupid. They, they put their, their right. stores Right, right on, on the line. line. Right, right on the line. Right. So, I mean, we're, we're losing out on, on quite a bit there. Um, and, and I'd like to see that money stay in, in my hometown. Yeah. District 2 fascinates me because it's uh, the whole west side, except for where District 1 is, obviously. Uh, and then even comes across the river a little bit into Allen and that area. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what would it be like to represent a district that's so big and diverse like that one? Uh, it's interesting. Um, I, uh, I've grown up here. I'm from Wicomico. Um, both of my parents are, were in the ag and horticulture side, so uh, I, know I grew up on farms and in fire halls in the area. Um, my mom uh, used to always drag me to, to every, you know, every time. She worked in uh, the extension office, which is anytime there was a tree issue or a new bug issue, <laughs> you know, I had to go and, and and, and see all the areas. So I, I was fortunate to, to really get to see all that Wicomico has to offer. Um, but it's, it's diverse and, and I, and I love that. You know, I love that we live in a place where, um, you know, we can go out to bivalve and, um, out to the beaches, you know, all the way to the West. And then we can go up North to Sharptown and, and see all the farmland up there, um, and still have, 
you know, part of downtown Salisbury and, yeah. and, and the river there. Uh, so I, I think we're really fortunate, and I've always been very proud uh, to grow up here. Um, being a busy business guy, can you balance being on a council and having running a business? <laughs> Uh, I've, I've always question. been fascinated. I'm, growing up in the city, I used to see these council members who worked 15 hours a day in their hotel, and then they would go to council meetings at night. I, I, I was always fascinated by that. It's uh, it's a balance, but I mean that, that's everything. Uh, it, it's very beneficial to me that if you know I can work at my business and then go to a council meeting because it's across the street. My bar is right across Good the street point. from <laughs> from the office building. So anytime that I've wanted to go to a council meeting or, or anytime something happens. And, you know, whether it's a historical committee meeting or a liquor board meeting, um, I, I hear about all this stuff. They, they come in, they'll talk to me, they'll tell me what's going on. Um, so I don't miss much. Flooding in District 2 is in, across the county, but you're hearing most of it in District 2. Um, certainly, we've lost the Nanticoke Road Bridge again um, from flooding. Mm -hmm. um, County council members tell me it's the biggest phone call they get. The most phone calls they get is about flooding. Mm -hmm. Have you given any thought to this issue, what we need to do? I have, uh, and you know, I, whether it's phone calls or you know, you see it on uh, on Facebook, and you know, every time we have one of these, it's oh, it's the hundred year flood or the hundred year rain, the hundred year storm, um, but it's happening every year now, and you know, I I know that climate change. I, I did a climate change um, a forum at Salisbury, and there was still some there's debate about climate change, uh, and. I'm going to play the devil's advocate uh, for the people that want to disagree with it. You know, let's let's prepare. Let's let's just say you know we can uh, we can say that it's not happening all we want, but you know if it's not happening, we have nothing to worry about. If it is happening, then we need to prepare. Um, and I think that um, there's no harm in preparing for this. Uh, I'm I'm actually a big supporter of Bill McCain because of the flooding issue. Um, you know, he he's very invested in the infrastructure. Um, and, and the preparations that we need to make as a community um, to make sure we hold on and maintain um, what we have. And, you know, roadways getting flooded out, uh, farms being flooded, you know, these are all big concerns, and that kind of thing only grows to homes uh, and businesses. You know, my, my, my business has had a little bit of flooding, and so I've had a fight with that, so I've had to prepare myself um, but as a community, we, we need to prepare as much of Wicomico as we can, um, whether that's, you know, educating um, our people, uh, building up our infrastructure, um, sewers, uh, you know, spillways, drainage, um, the dam. We need to prepare for that kind of stuff because it's not a big deal until it happens. And then, you know, we're left with our pants down. <laughs> How can people get a hold of you if they want to ask you more questions about your campaign or your stances? Uh, Besides coming into my, I, my bar, uh, I have uh, my Facebook page, my email. Um, I'm always available. Uh, you know, Please come by, um, reach out to me. I've had several people do so, and I, I absolutely love engaging uh, with the people of Comico. Anything I can do to help, I'm, I'm always ready to. He's Alexander Scott. He's running for county council, District 2, and we were thrilled to have him here today. Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you so much. Thank really you. really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Joining me now in the studio is the current incumbent in District 2, County Councilman Mark Kilmer. Welcome, Mark. It's always great to be with you. So you're running for re-election. This is your first re-election bid. Yeah. How does it feel out there? What are you hearing? Well, it's uh, still pretty early. It's still pretty early, and people are just starting to get engaged. But, you know, it seems that people are, um, you know, they like the way the county's going. They like the, what Governor Hogan's doing. And so, you know, I just hope that people are happy with, you know, what we've done on taxes and tried to do on spending and, and on roads and uh, things like that. So I, you know, I, I'm running on my record and I, I think it's a good record and, and I hope the voters support me again. People tell me all the time they don't know what district they're in. So, <laughs> which just surprises me, but yeah. describe your, the boundaries of your district for me. Well, District 2, it, uh, it's really the western, probably the western third of Wicomico County. It's a big district. Yeah, yeah, I mean. In, in know, terms of land. Yeah, all, all the districts have an equal amount of population, right. but um, I happen to represent the one with, uh, I think it's probably the least densely populated. It goes from Sharptown down through Mardella Springs, um, the outside of Hebron, um, and some of the western neighborhoods of Wicomico County, you know, Centennial Village, Nithsdale, um, and then a little bit of Fruitland across the river. Uh, Tony Tank is in the district, and then it goes down to Allen. So it's, uh, it's a large area, and then, then out to Bivalve, Tyaskin, down the, you know, the Nanticoke Road area. So. 
are you proud of the work you've done in your first term? I think so. I think we've you know done good work. I mean, there's always things you know could do differently. There's always mistakes that have been made. So I mean, I'm certainly not perfect, but I, I think that my record's a strong one. I think that I've done a good job representing my constituents, I'm trying to always um, you know ask the right questions, um, you know stand on principle, um, do what I believe is right, regardless of you know even if it, even if I'm on the losing end of a six to one vote. Um, I, I have no regrets in anything like that, and I, I hope the people appreciate that and, and that they'd, uh, you know, they'd, they'd support me again. Two things you're known for is being a hawk on the budget. Um, I, I try. <laughs> when s some sort of spending seems like it's just headed right on through, you're real good at the last minute of going, wait a minute, let's talk about this thing some more a little bit. I, I, try, I try not to be at the last minute. <laughs> well, you, you, know, you know, this stuff is always, you know, I try not to sandbag, you know, right. anybody on this sort of stuff. You know, I always try you're to have very good communication. I'll give you that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we try to have good communication with, you know, John Cannon, who's our president, and the executive's office, and say, look, here are some issues that I think, and I don't necessarily... You know, you know, sometimes, you know, it's not, I'm not necessarily going to oppose it. It's just we need more information or we need it clarified. And, and I think that that's what, you know, the people um, of Wicomico County demand is that, you know, we need to look at the budget closely. And even if it's a small amount of money, uh, we need to make sure that tax dollars are being used as efficiently as possible. And the other thing you've been a great advocate for and a great help to John Cannon and the others is in these charter amendments <laughs> in that, you know, changing yeah. the way that the county charter is designed. Which it, it needs to be, you know, kind of rubbery in terms of how things change, yeah. especially with the county executive model only being in for just what is it, eight years now? Yeah. Uh, no, sixteen years now, <laughs> twelve years it's, now. Yeah, yeah three 12 terms, years, twelve years, yeah, now. 12 years now. So it's a relatively new situation overall, and you guys are finding things that need to be tinkered with. Yeah, well, on the charter and even in our legislative code, we find a lot that hasn't hasn't kept up with the executive form of government, with our change of government and how things work. You know, we're looking at now, um, you know, how to deal with street signs, you know, and, how, and should, how much the council should be involved. Because council used to be involved a lot with setting street sign, you know, changing street signs, and county code hasn't kept up with that. And so we need to go back and make sure that the executive's office, you know, the executive branch has, you know, the authority to do what it needs to do. And the charter is the same way. You know, there's some things that as we've gone through these 12 years of, you know, uh, two executives now, and, you know, these three, you know, the, the councils, of how uh, we work together and how the operations are day to day, you know, sometimes the charter just uh, just didn't work as envisioned or certain things need to be tightened up. And, you know, both John Cannon and I were on the charter review committee, and so that has given us some, you know, background in reviewing these things. But when we were on the charter review committee, we pointed, you know, there was a lot of things that we saw on that committee as needed changing. And so that's, that, that's part of the work we're trying to do on the council now, is take what we did on the charter review committee and bring it forward, you know, to the voters. It's ultimately up to the voters to change the charter. It's not up to the council. That's a, it's a minor thing, and you mentioned the street signs. Um, and I never thought of this. I thought there was a process for this. But if I'm a resident and I want a, a stop sign put up, I call my county council member who calls perhaps roads or goes to the county. But there was no exact process for this thing, and that never occurred to me. It never really occurred to me either until um, we got into a situation down in Tiascan, actually, over the past couple months where right. um, it involved probably about you know, 15 or 16 people, and a stop sign went up. Um, you know, the council doesn't put up stop signs. It's, it's the roads that puts it sure. up. But, you know, there's this impression that you call your council member and the council member talks to roads and you get a street sign up. And so I received a lot of phone calls and a lot of emails from that area. And we had a meeting down there. I mean, you know, I spent 20 or 30 hours dealing with this, right. you know, this situation that is very important to the people that live in the area. Though. Right. And it's the fact that we didn't really have a process in place. It was just, you know, that, well, this is the way we assume things went. And so, it really needs to nail down things so that people feel like their voices are heard by the county government. Because the big issue there was they thought that this sign went up without the county government really taking into the need, right. taking into consideration their needs and their views. And it's very important that people, you know, the county government listens to people, considers what works for the people in, in an area, and that, that, that we hear out what people's voices are. And that didn't really happen in that situation. And, you know, we see that in a lot of the things where people get mad at the county government is that they don't feel the county government's listening to them. And I think that that's something I've tried to, you know, alleviate and going, you know, I'm out in the community a lot. I'm out in Mardella Springs and Sharptown and Allen and down at the west side a lot. You're just listening to what people's complaints are. You know, I was down in the west side this past Tuesday and, you know, someone said, hey, you know, we, there's these three things that are, you know, we have down here that's a problem. So, you know, the next morning I went back and emailed Wayne Strasburg, director of administration. I said, here, this is what I'm hearing, Wayne. You know, people are upset right. with the county. And so... It's very important to have a responsive council member. That's really what it's all about. Yeah. You know, being that interim between you know people's needs and and getting it done. 
Yeah, and we're lucky that we're a relatively small county. We have relatively small county government. I mean, if you want to get hold of any of your council members, it's pretty easy to find our phone numbers or stop by our house or anything like that. And so, you know, it's lucky that I think we do have a very responsive county government. And and sometimes people just need to bring it to the attention of their council member that hey, there's a you know light down at the convenience center, or you know, or, or the grass is too high around this tower. So, you know, we're we're happy to help you out. And I think that um, I've really tried to be accessible. My you know, my phone number is, you know, anybody wants to call, anyone who wants to email, I've always, you know, take any, anybody who calls, anybody who emails, whether in my district or not, and I'm happy to try to make sure that our county government is really uh, serving the people. This last budget cycle, we saw something we haven't seen in a long time, um, where it seemed like more people were advocating for increased education spending. There was a push mm -hmm. on that. Uh, Superintendent definitely has some goals, pre-K, being one of those things mm -hmm. that she was funded. Um, you were very involved in that. You were in a listening phase for a while, and then you showed some leadership on the issue. Um, where are you with the education spending? Well, um, education spending can be part of a quality education system, but it's not necessarily um, doesn't lead to quality education. I mean, you know, we Washington D.C., Baltimore, they spend far more per pupil than Wicomico County does, and I think I would take up the quality of our schools any day over the quality of their school system. Right. The good thing about Dr. Halen is, is that she presents her budget and then she says, you know, here's what I want above maintenance of effort and here's specifically what it will be used for. You know, she has, she had very specific line items about, you know, you give us this amount, it will be used for this, here's what this will be used for. And so it allows us to look and evaluate and say, all right, you know, this is worthy, this is something that we think, you know, has been proven to work. And so that, that's the sort of thing I like to see is that I'm not necessarily opposed to spending more money than maintenance of effort but it has to be on specific things. It has to be things that are, you know, we, that we can measure as a proven outcome. You know, we will be demanding, you know, um, to see how this, whether or not the promises made for this pre-K spending come to fruition in, you know, five years, six years. And so, you know, you know, that's where I am. But we also have to be careful about maintenance of effort because that resets us next year. We are obligated to spend that amount of money again next year. And so it locks us into increased spending. So we have to be very cautious about going above maintenance of effort. So I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but it has to be a process that can't be something we just rubber stamp or just do without any thought given to because it has severe ramifications long term for the county budget when we go above that. So as you go into your second term, you're going to be more of a veteran now. Are you going to be showing more leadership on the council or how does that work? Is the council a team or? Our council has worked very well together as a team, I think. Um, you know, we're six Republicans and one Democrat, but there's no partisan differences on the county council. Um, we all work very well together. Even when we have disagreements, I think we all get along well. We all communicate well with each other. So I, I would hope, you know, that when the council changes, there's going to be at least two new members on the council. And I hope that we have that same sort of relationship with each other where we're um, agreeable even when we disagree, where we communicate well with each other, and we're always willing to, you know, if we vote, you know, we could vote against each other in one vote, and the next vote we cooperate with each other. So I, I hope that continues. A uh, lot of focus on the county executive, everybody's different roles. There's been some tensions there, even in your first term, and the county executive's first term, which was unusual, I thought, because he came from the council. Um, you would think that he would be more in tune with the council than he is at times. Any thoughts about that, that county executive system? Well, you have different roles to play. County executive has a different role to play than when you're on the council. And we have a different role to play, too. We're not there to be the rubber stamp for the executive. We're not there just to do whatever the executive wants. And I mean, and that's what I said you know, four years ago when it was, you know, we didn't know who the executive would be. I said, you know, I'm not going to be a rubber stamp for the executive. The legislative branch has a role to play. We, in our system, it's mainly saying, you know, no. I, you know, we, we kind of act as a veto on a lot of the stuff the executive wants to do. We can't initiate a lot of things, but we can kind of veto what he wants to do. And we've played that role, and we've been a more robust council, I think, than had been seen, um, you know, in the past, in the previous eight years. And, you know, I'm a big believer in separation of powers. I'm a big believer that, you know, checks and balances and that the people are well served when you have that healthy tension between the two branches of government where, you know, it's not everybody just hopping on board something and, and going off, um, you know, without any thought to it. It's where you sit and you talk about it and you say, well, what about this and what about that? You know, I don't think it's the role of the council just to be devil's advocate and try to stop everything the executive does. I do think it's our role to say that when we have problems with something to say, no, we need more time to do this or no, we don't agree with that and we're not going to do it. And regardless of who's elected, you know, this next time or whoever sits there, if I'm on the county council, it will be the same role. I'm, I'm not, not going to let, you know, anybody try to say that I should agree with the executive 
because he happens to be of the same party or because I happen to be friends with him or anything like that. I mean, I had, you know, I mean, again, I've had my disagreements with the executive. That, that's not a secret, as you say. And I've had people, you know, get upset with me about that and say, you know, you know, when the captain of the team says to do something, you do it. And I say, you must understand the two roles of government. He's not the captain of the team. It's two separate branches. And it's, we have a different role to play in our system. And he, he's not the boss of us, and we're not the boss of him either. And so I think it's healthy when we have disagreement. Some of the ways we've had disagreement, you know, could have probably been done better. That's, I think it's a learning process. But, you know, I, I will not hesitate to be check some, you know, to check and to try to balance the executive, no matter no matter who's the executive. Yeah, I, th I think in terms of building a reputation for the county, it's better if everybody gets along or they seem civil at least. Yeah. But I had a county councilman tell me one time that he wasn't on a team at all. His team was his constituents, and he was the coach of that team. And the, the council wasn't a team at all, um, <laughs> which was, I never thought of it that way, but I could sort of see that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, ultimately, my boss is not John Cannon, the council president, or, yeah. or any of the other council members. It's the voters of District 2. And if they, if they don't like what I'm doing, if they don't like that I disagree with the executive on certain issues, that's fine. And they're legitimate to vote against me because of that. I mean, that they ultimately, I'm supposed to represent them. And if I stop doing that, if, if my actions in office don't represent what they want, then it's perfectly legitimate for them to, to select someone else. And that's how our system of government works. And so, you know, John Cannon is the president of the council, and he sets the agenda, and we, and we do try to work together as a team. But, you know, I vote against John a good amount of time. I mean, you know, and, and so, but it's never disagreeable. It's never anything like that. And I'm, I'm ha as long as the process works fairly, as long as there's the charters followed, uh, pro and nobody gets sandbagged or anything like that, and there's not any sort of... Uh, trying to be underhanded about things. I'm fine to take a vote. I'm fine to lose a vote as long as as long as everything's done fairly and everyone has had their chance it, to be heard. And I have to give you a lot of credit. Even when you vote against something, you're very articulate about why. Oh. I mean, there's no mystery about, you know, <laughs> why, is, is he just mad about something or what it is? You always have a really good explanation for what it is. And I think that it helps grow the democracy and the whole system. Well, I, I think people deserve an explanation, especially when you're... Um, maybe an outlier, and, and I probably am more of an outlier than, than some council members, you know, in terms of voting no on things. But I think people deserve an explanation when you are, you know, six to one and you're the one. People deserve to know why you're the one. Right. So, Any magic moments um, when something happened, you're like, wow, I'm, I'm glad I was here for this? Well, I mean, I think that a lot of the magic moments happen out when you're serving constituents, out when you, you know, are talking with people and you help them in terms of, you know, you're solving a, you know, helping them solve a drainage problem or helping them solve an issue with the county government where they express appreciation or people or people say to you, you know, look, I don't really agree with you on many issues, but, you know, you, you listen, you take our phone calls, you try to, you know, help us out with the problems we have with the county. So we appreciate that, even though, you know, we may be 100 degrees, you know, 180 degrees opposite on, on what we think. And so, you know, it's not a specific moment, but it is, you know, moments like that that, that you think, you know, I, you know, I'm doing some good here. So Knowing you, who mm -hmm. you are, and yeah. how you think about things, the yeah. dam washes out. Yeah. We're not rebuilding that dam. We're not going to spend the money on that thing. But you listen to constituents, and I guess they talked you into it, or maybe you were always supportive of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. and got it done. And I, I was just surprised by that and very impressed. Well, I mean, I, I don't think the county government shouldn't do anything at all. I mean, one of the main functions of the county government is roads, and that's an issue that I hear from more than any other, uh, you know, from people about more than any other is our road issue or drainage issues. And that had been an issue that had been ongoing of concern with the people in the area that that was going to wash out. Right. Unfortunately, it did wash out, and, you know, we had some disagreement about why and things like that. But... It's ultimately the county's responsibility to rebuild that road. I mean, and so, you know, we have to keep up with our infrastructure. We have to make sure that people can get around the areas. And just because it's a rural road that may not be as heavily used as some of the roads in Salisbury doesn't mean it's not important to the people in the area. And so when it's necessary for the county government to spend money, and roads is one of the areas where I do think it's vitally important we spend money, it, we need to do that. And that's one of the areas that, unfortunately, we had to spend more money than, than should have. But, it, you know, it's, it's an important road and it needs to be put back. So, you know, roads, landfill, all these things that aren't glamorous. I mean, you know, you, you, don't, you don't see a lot of news stories in the Salisbury Independent about Bicamo County roads or, you know, or the landfill. But, but, you know, these are the things that people rely upon every single day. And they don't pay much attention to it except when they wash out or they can't use them. Right. And that's when we hear about them. We, we don't hear about the great condition of county roads usually. Right. We hear when county roads go wrong. And the County Roads Department does great work, and the people there do great. I mean, you know, they're up against weather, and they're up against a lot of other things. So I'm not criticizing them, but it's just, you know, roads are very important. Drainage is very important. And they had six years where they had no money. Yeah, I mean, the, the, 
the money being taken away by the state really put the county into a backlog situation where we're trying to catch up now in terms of dealing with drainage dishes and dealing with maintenance and all that sort of stuff. And, and we're starting to catch up now, but a lot of the drainage problems we're having now probably would have been better had the state not taken away that money, you know, starting in 2010. Right. So, How can people get a hold of you as we get here to the end of the election? Well, um, I have a website, um, uh, kilmerforcouncil.com. I have a Facebook page. Um, my phone number is on the county website. Anybody's, you, know, you can call me. Um, you can email me. I'm always happy to uh, listen to complaints, concerns, or, you know, the, if anybody wants to praise the job the county's doing, I'm always happy to hear that, too. So. He's Mark Kilmer. He's our current incumbent District 2 County Council member running for re-election for a second term, and we're thrilled to have him here today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. I'm Greg Bassett from the Salisbury Independent Newspaper, another edition of 101 right here on PAC-14. First Shore Federal is proud to support PAC-14 and one-on-one. -on -one. We'd encourage every business to support PAC-14 and, and pick a program and support it and let's make a difference.